incidentally he had what's called the ccs and i had what's called the c3s so ours is the chennai center for china studies of which i am the director and he looks at the center for contemporary studies on china and uh, you know with the first hand experience he is also a sinologist he is in china and therefore i am sure we will derive phenomenal amount of insights into why we are where we are today and as far as i am concerned i have been in the navy for over 34 years i was commissioned in 1969 so i saw war in 1971 there after i joined aviation so where i commanded uh, a squadron and two air stations i was also part of the ipkf where i was commanding a warship and i was the regional commander of the coast guard region east with jurisdiction in the area of bengal and uh, since my retirement that's way back in 2003 i been part of many things many think tanks i was with observe research foundation initially thereafter with center for asia studies and then I'm also part of the National Center Foundation as the regional director, and I've been the director of the Chennai Center for China Studies for the last six years. So we continue to depend on uh, uh, our resources, which consists of people from uh, diverse uh, backgrounds, IAS, IAF, professors, and our main strength is from the young minds. We have about 300 of them who are working with us on a virtual platform. and we also conduct uh, many internship programs through the year and this year was a record that covid where we had about uh, 50 plus interns completing their summer internship programs the focus is clearly china and as i said earlier this is the only think tank away from delhi which specializes in looking at china a peninsular think tank that that has its focus focus to provide a alternate perspective not necessarily you need to be different from what delhi thinks but we would like to look at it very differently and provide those insights which are from these uh, experts who we have with us as members as well as the benefit of young minds who always try to probe and ask us questions which is what we encourage in our think tank over to general narsimhan uh thank you very much one uh, commander wasan sir <clears throat> I was commissioned into the Madras Regiment, which is an infantry regiment, in 1977. Uh, thereafter, I served for 40 years in the Indian Army before I retired in 2016. I did a tenure in uh, in in Beijing as a defence attaché, and thereafter, for the last 20 years, I have been following China, and I have commanded formations, brigade, division, and the core level formations on the Chinese border post retirement. i also commanded the army war college which is supposed to be a premier uh, institution for training in the um, uh, in the army and i after retirement i joined the national security national security advisory board in 2016 at the moment i am doing my second tenure in addition i have taken over the director as director general of uh, center for contemporary studies in uh, in in delhi which is a uh, Think tank started by the Ministry of External Affairs. It's a it's a whole of government approach. The officers doing research with me are all serving government of India officers drawn from various departments of the government. And this center has been in existence for almost two and a half years now. And we do research on international relations, internal issues, and uh, defense and security issues, science and technology, economy, and bilateral relations of China. so that is the that is the way we have organized ourselves and that is what the center does work on and uh, i'll i'll open this uh, i'll request commodore wasan to open this discussion and thereafter we'll take it from there uh, thank you general narsimhan i don't think uh, we could have found a better person to deal with this you know who has first hand experience along the border uh, at different levels and then after having been in china you would be able to Think through their minds, which is always a difficult proposition for all of us. And uh, what we will do today, uh, this is the proposal that I have, is that initially we will address three three questions, which in uh, essence will summarize as to what we want to do. How did we land up today in the position that we are in today? You know, this is vis-a-vis China. What is it that we have done right in the past? 
and what is it that we could have done better in terms of dealing with an aggressive neighbor china and then of course what is the way ahead you know when you are talking about way ahead everybody tries to tell you that we are at crossroads the problem with that is the crossroads have signs which are hazy and we can't really see what this crossroad signs indicate to us so perhaps we will have to write it ourselves and then choose the path that will be of importance to us so i request you to set the ball rolling by uh, you know giving us an overview of where we start today and thereafter we will discuss the the parameters of how we landed up where we landed up and then move forward from there on i am also very happy to inform the audience that swatantra is encouraging a local app an indian app milan setu which is where we are networked and that is being streamed by simultaneously so we need to encourage our own you know we keep on saying local for local and local for local but unless we start using these apps i know and keep giving them feedback we will not be able to bring them up to global levels so i am very happy and must compliment swatan for also using this app along with youtube to reach out to the audience uh, you know who who will definitely get today's interaction and as uh, uh, the organizers have already indicated to you you can send your questions on whatsapp to the number that is given there and they will choose the five best questions which are relevant and then between general narsimhan and sir we'll try and answer those questions what is general narsimhan thank you thank you very much uh, commander wasan uh, if we want to answer the first question how did we land ourselves in the position what we see today i think then we need to go back into history and that will take a very long time but what i will do is i'll try and summarize it in 2 to 3 minutes so that we understand the basis on which we are working and how we have we have we have reached the situation as it exists today the origins of this problem starts in 1954 when the chinese made a western highway through the aksai chain and 1954 is also the year in which we published the first map of india with a entire aksai chain and others included in our in our in our territory there is a lot of historical basis for arriving at that map i will not go into the details of it if there is some questions which come up i'll take it subsequently 57 is the time we realized that this road has been made and thereafter we have been trying to send the petrols up aksai chain in 1956 chavan lal who was the then premier of china gave a claim line to india that they said that this is the line that comes up as territory of theirs in 1959 he confirmed that line so the 1956 and 1959 lines have been confirmed by the former premier of china to be their lines of line uh, la, the border that depicts their territory in 1960 they gave a variation to that line which is moving further little to the west of the line that they had committed in 56 and 59 then came 62 war in which at the end of it the chinese had moved further west of their claim line of 1959 and 1960 but at the end of the war they went back into that area until today from 1960 onwards we follow that particular line as the claim line of china and that line corresponds to the line of actual control in eastern ladakh so this is in short i have given you a given you a rundown of how it happened and how this lac has come into existence in western western theater yeah come to uh, eastern theater yeah well, uh, uh, general uh, a quick question in the interest of uh, the audience so we talk about mcmahon line i am so, coming to that yeah okay please i am coming to that Uh, when i said eastern sector actually mcmahon mcmahon it is not mcmohan we are, we are used to the word yeah yeah we are used to the word mohan and so we keep saying mohan but it is mcmahon m a h o n so mcmahon is a, is a britisher who do this line east of bhutan up to myanmar and that line is known as mcmahon line and mcmahon line was also ratified i won't say ratified it was signed by the british rep the tibetan rep and the chinese rep in 1914 as part of the shimla accord 
and the chinese have not accepted that line therefore you have a dispute on the mcmahon line and that mcmahon and chinese claim the whole of arunachal pradesh till the till the till the foothills of assam as their territory so this is the mcmahon line in the east and in the ladakh sector as i told you it is the claim line of china and in sikkim in between where this incident happened on the 9th of may in sikkim that time it was sikkim it was a kingdom and there was no dispute in territory between the kingdom of sikkim and tibet therefore the portion of sikkim we consider it to be international boundary the rest of the areas we consider it to be line of actual control so that is how the line of actual control has come into existence so this is where you have this problem and thereafter what has happened in about mid 70s there was a china study group it still exists in a, in a larger form today at that point in time it consisted of only three secretaries of the state government of india and couple of representatives of uh, the rndw and the ib and these are the people who gave the limits of petroleum it is known as limits of petroleum basically because beyond which the petroleum was not allowed and those are the petrol points which you get to hear now you must have heard, heard about pp14 pp15 pp17 etc and these are the petroleum points that have been laid down around that time there after periodically they were reviewed wherever we could go ahead that it was revised the petroleum points were revised so this is the petroleum points and the origin of petroleum points and this is the line of actual control we have got now regarding the resolution of the boundary after the 62 war till about 76 we did not have diplomatic relations diplomatic relations were there but the embassy was actually downgraded we didn't have an ambassador there in 1976 mr k r narayanan went as the first ambassador and thereafter first ambassador after the break that was there thereafter things started improving in 1988 Mr Rajiv Gandhi made that famous visit of his to be Beijing where he met the supreme leader at that point in time called paramount leader they call it as uh, Mr Tan Sri Aping and thereafter the bilateral relations started improving in 1993 the first agreement we signed with them was the border peace and tranquility agreement that happened when Mr Narasimha Rao went to China in 1996 we signed the conference building measures agreement when Mr Chiang Semin visited India and thereafter there was in 1993 after that first agreement was signed in 1994 we we set up two joint working groups one from the indian side and one from the uh, chinese side to resolve the boundary issue they had about 14 meetings in between them still progress was very slow to speed up the process in 2003 when mr vatpai visited peking at that time they came to an understanding that from each side they will nominate a special representative and the special representatives came into existence in 2003 and thereafter they were supposed to go through a three stage process of resol- resolving the boundary first stage was the political parameters and guiding principles which were supposed to be set up and that agreement we signed in 2005 when mr banchi apa the, the former premier of china when he visited delhi in april 2005 we signed that agreement thereafter the second stage started the second stage is the toughest stage basically because then we need to work on the principles under which at each of the locations you will you will identify the boundary so there was there there is the toughest part which is going on at this point and you find that 23 rounds of talks have taken place 23rd round was being virtual just about 10 days ago on uh, not about 10 days to uh, a week ago on the 5th of uh, 5th of july before the 22 special representative talks have taken place basically they are trying to set down the principles under which we will be able to resolve this boundary and this is a tougher part thereafter the third part will be to actually demarcate the boundary as per the principle that have been agreed in the stage 2 that means in a three stage process we are in stage 2 that is how we have landed up in the situation in between the line of actual control is not a accepted line between both the side between india and china therefore we started a process of tariffing the lac in 2000 in the middle sector we exchanged our maps showing perception of the line of actual control as per each side but we when we wanted to 
say exchange the maps in the western sector the chinese backed off and thereafter our efforts to get them to clarify the line of actual control have not borne fruit so that is where the problem lies and therefore since you do not have a, 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 an agreed boundary between india and china whenever the petrols come across in the border you find this phase off taking place coming to the phase offs i will start from 67 when natula and chola came into it, came into came in natula and chola incidents came up wherein when we were wanting to lay a barbed wire line in natula the chinese opened fire on the indian forces the indian forces retaliated and the casualties on the chinese side were very heavy at that time that gave the indication to the chinese that even though in 67 we suffered a defeat the armed forces are back to normal in 67 and can give them the kind of kind of uh, reply that they didn't expect thereafter between 67 and 86 there were hardly any incidents there were minor minor phase offs on the border which was resolved at the local level in 86 in samdrumchu the chinese came in samdrumchu is a post which our intelligence bureau used to hold and they used to vacate that post for winters when they went back in the next summer they found the chinese had come and occupied that post so then indian armed forces launched operation falcon and operation checkerboard by general sundar ji at that point in time and we surrounded the chinese from three sides but after seven years of negotiations the chinese went back and we also pulled back so therefore it took seven years to resolve the samdrum chu issue between 1976 and 2013 again there were no major incidents and the incidents were resolved locally by the tactical commanders from 2013 onwards you find an increase in the incidents particularly in major incidents 2013 in debsang belt which you would have heard during the last two months the chinese came in and pitched up tents we also pitched up our tents opposite to them to force them out and three weeks later they withdrew in 2014 in chuma again chinese came with heavy road building equipment we opposed the face off took place to for two weeks and then they withdrew in 2017 i don't have to tell you what happened in doklam dolam and dolam incident is well known i will not dwell on it further in 2020 again in ladakh and galwan as well as in pankunso and in nakula in sikkim these incidents have taken place pankunso is not new to these incidents when dolam incident was happening in 2017 you found in pankunso for the first time both the both the forces actually resorted to stone pelting there was the first time the violence levels increased so from 2013 onwards you find ladakh being in focus more and more and these kinds of incidents have been increasing in violence and that is how we have landed up in the situation that we landed up we landed up ourselves at today the second thing is in the last two months whatever has happened all people have read all kinds of things on the, on the which has been coming in the media what typically happened was on 5th of june both the places galwan as well as in pankungso the chinese came up in larger numbers there were scuffle between the forces both the sides suffered injuries then they actually had a, a, had a stand off and that stand off continued till 15th of june and it is continuing till today in some form but till 15th of june the stand off was there in nakula in sikkim on the 9th of june there was again a face off like this wherein the chinese claimed an area inside our territory up to the area called wall this wall is actually made by the glaciers to protect themselves from the high velocity winds that that uh, that actually are in that area to protect their cattle as well as protect themselves they put up a temporary wall chinese claim that this wall was made by the glaciers and so therefore they should have the area up to that place but nakula is the place where the watershed goes and all along the border between india and china we go with the watershed principle wherein the water parts on either side of the ridge line is the watershed and watershed is the principle on which we actually deal with this this border situation so therefore in nakula the claim is absolutely un i mean unsubstantiated but in line of actual control in ladakh up to the line of actual control they want to exercise their control that is the reason they pushed it and the reason for that was the kind of infrastructure that you are making in that area that seems to have upset them and they didn't know our intentions of making this infrastructure therefore this problem has come up 
And when I say infrastructure, I don't mean the DSDBO road, Darbuk Shiok, developed by Goldie Road. DSDBO road is on the western bank of Shiok River and is well within our territory, and it has been in the making for more than a decade now. So there was no objection on that. The objection was for the infrastructure that was being created east of it towards the LAC. So that is the that is the issue that seems to have worried the Chinese, and the incidents happened. 15th of June incident, you are all aware what happened, and the people, lot of talks have taken place uh, between between the Lieutenant General level talks that took place on the 6th of June. On 15th, this incident happened in Belwan. 17th, the foreign ministers of both the countries spoke. 22nd, uh, 22nd and 30th, 22nd and 30th, there were two talks by the Lieutenant Generals again. They decided to disengage. That was also pushed up by the NSA level talks on the 5th of July. So this is where we stand as of today. So the way ahead at this point in time is I'm not going through the overall relations, but with reference to the incidents, I'll finish it here. Thereafter, I'll take on the questions by Commander Watson again. First process is the disengagement, and that process has been going on for some time now. From PP 15 and PP 17, troops are thinned out from the Chinese side. PP 14, there has been a withdrawal of both the sides, and Pan Kung Show. There has been a partial withdrawal from finger four, and that process is on, uh, will continue. The issue that comes up is, it is a step-by-step -step process, and many of us tend to believe that once the talks are over, next day everything should be disengaged. And that is not the process that will work. It is going to be a step-by-step -step process. Each step is going to be verified by both the sides, and thereafter another meeting will be held to ensure that this, this, this disengagement takes place uh, in a proper manner, in a step-by-step -step manner. So I, for one, believe it will take some time. We need to wait patiently, give a chance to the Chinese, even though on 15 June that incident happened, but verify what they are doing. So trust, but verify is the way to go from now on, at least till the situation gets back to status quo ante as it existed on April in April 2020. I will stop here. Boston, sir, if you have any more questions, please come up with it so that we can discuss it. Is he around? Yeah, we have lost uh, his video, and both his uh, audio and video seem to be muted. So, I, mean, I don't know. Okay. Anyway, let me... Okay, so let... I would like to throw my questions here. Yeah, uh, please do. Uh, what, is, what is our uh, take on uh, China's constant... Uh, uh, moves against uh, our Arunachal Pradesh region. So, and uh, second question will be maybe I, I can ask the second question after you answer this one because there is a... okay. China's constant move to ALP is something which we should understand from those uh, from the 1914 Shimla Accord, which I mentioned to you. They do not accept the McMahon line, which was existed, which was established in 1914. There are also reasons for it. One of the reasons is that that line was marked with a felt pen and in a, in a large scale map. And when you do it on a felt pen, even the thickness of that line indicates approximately 20 kilometers on ground. So in many places, it led to a lot of disagreement on the alignment of the, of the line of actual control. So therefore, that is one point. The second point is, in 62, when the war happened, they actually came almost up to the foothills of Assam. But they knew that they could not sustain themselves on this side of the Himalayas through the winter. And so they had to push back. They pushed back, but the claim on Arunachal Pradesh, they kept it alive. And in 2000, around 2004, 2005, they, call, they started calling it as, as South Tibet, Southern Tibet. Right. And thereafter, recently, they have actually given the Chinese names for the districts in Arunachal Pradesh. So slowly and steadily what has happened is the claim has been kept alive. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they will get, get Arunachal Pradesh or a part of it. So they can keep claiming whatever they want, but I don't think anything is going to happen on that score. Yeah, So, but, but, but my question here is, if they don't want to go with the Shimla Accord, why should we? So then we can also claim their areas as ours, right? And then see, the issue that comes up is, in you need to go back to what I explained to you earlier. 
the problem was we were not able to extend our presence up to the areas which is shown on our map mm-hmm. because of you can say the underdeveloped nature of the terrain there because of the the, the numbers were less with us and so we were not able to do that infrastructure was lacking even if you pushed up the troops you wouldn't be able to sustain them therefore many number of reasons led to we not dominating the area up to which we claim to be our territory and that gave chinese the leverage because on the chinese side the terrain is very simple it is a flat plateau and they could drive anywhere they want so it is the terrain that helped them to actually come and claim that area which which they have claimed in ladakh but what happens is if we agree to 1914 shimla accord then you also get arunachal pradesh you also get excite and therefore we should follow definitely the shimla accord whether the chinese follow the shimla accord or otherwise right yeah, uh, i can uh, just chip in yeah, on yeah. On. Uh, so ramesh one second yeah no no yes, sir uh, we were waiting for you so till then okay. i was asking so there was a disconnection oh, thank you for that there's no, a disconnection of the internet so i had to you thank you over to you no problem thank you general narsimhan sorry for that brief interruption and there was a technical uh, blackout so i had to relog in uh, sorry for that but i i heard the whole thing and i think it's a wonderful exposition of why we reached where we are this is in terms of the border in terms of the line of actual control but also in terms of the ccl that is a chinese control line you know there are far too many things which are there and my own uh, you know two paisa worth assessment is that very simple uh, by and large all of us uh, analysts agree that china has been uh, using this salami slicing which is a term that everybody understands now that means you walk in three steps go back two steps negotiate wait for another time come back again so this goes on uh, all the time so this is where they have uh, taken advantage of the ground reality even over here general narsimhan will vouch for it uh, you know even here apparently there is a actual summer exercise that takes place and this time we knew that they were doing this exercise but quietly because of the covid while india's attention was drawn to containing the pandemic they pitched their tents as they said but after the exercise they did not go back so you know uh, there were a lot of uh, things that are amiss over here in terms of the assessment at the strategic level and the tactical level but what i would like to also add is that there are a lot of other contributions at the global level as to why we are today where we are this is in terms of china's aspirations its ambitions to be number one it is not looking at uh, india in fact some of the <clears throat> statements that have been made earlier referred to you no know, china taking over as asia's number one they are not set their sights at asia they are looking at replacing uh, america and the west you know which was predominantly a democratic uh, way encourage china to integrate in the mainstream of democratic system so that it becomes a major player in the global order this was something that everybody expected to happen it has not happened and you know china has caught its own you know path in terms of so called peaceful rise you know everybody you know bought this term of peaceful rise and you know unfortunately it's it's not been a peaceful rise and they are very good in following their own uh, leaders confucius sun tzu and all that so here it was question of biding for your time building your strength and challenging anybody at an opportune time i'm sure general rasiman would be more aware than me as i'm not proficient in chinese on the chinese proverb which apparently says loot your neighbor's house when it is on fire so which is exactly what they try to do when you know the covid pandemic was being tackled around the world so, so only they, have, they have set the fire, fire also in the neighbor's house so <laughs> no, no, no. in south china state is the same thing so when everybody was trying to unite together in their war against the pandemic and they tried to use this time to consolidate their gains in south china sea you know needle their neighbors including japan vietnam indonesia malaysia there is not a single person who has not been uh, needled by them when it comes to territorial claims you know the, in fact uh, there has also been a famous uh, charms offensive by the present ambassador which uh, who i am sure general narsimhan would have met so this charm offensive you would have seen on the tv yesterday day before but to say that uh, 
to ancient civilizations. We should not be at war. We should protect either interest. All this is to be taken with a bag of salt, because you know it's very simple that you know they are trying to now get out of this tricky situation where they are cornered by the rest of the world. It's becoming increasingly difficult for them economically. Huawei is facing tough problems because everybody is kicking out Huawei from their backyard. UK has taken a lead of the tech companies who are going to come together to have new technology. Ericsson, Cisco, and others are coming into the front. Italy has also kicked out. You know, Italy was a staunch supporter because of BRI investments. They kicked out. So China is in a bit of a spot when it comes to their economic ambitions. BRI is falling out of the sky. You know, India did a very wise thing by not supporting the Belt Road Initiative. We abstained from participating even in the BRF as a Belt Road Forum. And everybody, there are a lot there's a lobby here in India <coughs> which wants to join BRI and continue to fuel. China's ambitions. Is why we are very fortunate that we did not support the BRI because wherever they have gone, they are facing trouble. Particularly now because of the COVID pandemic, where African countries and others where they have invested are asking for a, either a loan waiver or a deferment of payment. Even Pakistan, their all-weather ally, is having serious doubts about continued investment into the BRI. So uh, you know, the way this is to put the global picture in perspective on why China is in a state that it is in and why it needs friends. But to start with, if you needed friends, why did you get into this misadventurism along our border? Because everything was going on smoothly. You know, China, in fact, I would go to the extent of saying that India, India's leaders, including the present leadership, have been trying to be extremely nice to China. You look at Mamalapuram, you look at Wuhan, you look at the Gujarat visit, and you know, by and large, the expectation was that we will be joint partners. But all these expectations have been belied, unfortunately. And China has stabbed us in the back, just like they did in 1962. On the infrastructure, the assignment is the best person to tell you. I was at these places about three years ago. Unfortunately, the phase of development on our side was not up to the mark. It's only in the recent, maybe five, 10 years that it's accelerated. Because we again have been always I'm sure General Nasiman will either counter me or will support me on this. You know, we always were so sensitive about the Chinese sentiments. What will the Chinese think if we build our thing? Even it's on our side. You know, even in Port Blair and Andaman Nicobar, there was this defensive mindset to say, no, no, we should not add on infrastructure because the Chinese are likely to be upset. So this is this defensive mindset that has encouraged China to use India to say one thing and do something else. So I think the time is right now, you know, right for us to look at those crossroads that I mentioned in the opening remarks and to carve out our own path, which takes us away from this dependence on China. You know, everybody keeps on saying, you know, what will you do without China? Please look at the number of, you know, the trade deficit that we have. The trade deficit of something like $60 billion is something that it uses in China-Pakistan economic corridor. So your money is directly going to build up its defense assets, to you know, fuel its ambitions along the economic route, along the maritime silk route, along the BRA, where is the obligation for India to support this at our cost? What has come inside in, in India? You know, these are questions that the viewers must seriously look at. On which occasion have we been supporting? The nuclear supplier group? No. United Nations Security Council? No. Expansion of UNGA? No. Ajar Mahud, Ajar Masood proscription? No. Where have we been supported by China? Is there a single occasion on which we have been supported? Where is our need for us to be so defensive? People are today defensive about what? Why are you so defensive? Does China ask permission of India? Or does it keep you informed when it carries out a major exercise with Pakistan and Russia in North Arabian Sea, which is so important to us for our energy security, for our maritime security diplomacy. So yeah, he's virtually poaching in our backyard and he doesn't tell you about it. So, but there are so much of serious objections when we say that US, Japan, Australia, and uh, you know, we need to be working together. From 2007, we take a long time to now even invite Australia after 2007 fiasco to get into the Malabar exercise, which is now going to happen sometime this year. So we need to get out of this defensive mindset 
look at a new part that is away from china people also tell you that you know there is so much of extent of coupling with china it will become difficult i keep on telling my youngsters in chennai center for china studies no pain no gain so you have to be able to take some of these hard paths and today the climate is wonderful for india to ensure that its dependence on china comes down people say what will happen to pharmaceuticals you will pay a higher price you know this api and other things gujarat today is taking a lead and you know we will we will face difficulties you now this is where i would like to remind the audience that after the famous ukraine blast we faced sanction by the west you know after the nuclear explosion where we became a nuclear power so we faced stiff sanctions this was something like 3 years and that's when india reinvented itself so let's have faith in india's capability how did this app came about that we are using today it's because of the fact that there is a capability and capacity that is within which you do not recognize we fail to encourage and we need to get out of this and start having belief in ourselves it's only then will be take on china china is not trying to cozy up to you again trying to again take you up the rosy path and please be careful of its attempts to get you back on its sides from the isolated i would like mr sorry general narsimha to come back here and discuss to what are in terms of how we need to you know carve out our own path which is independent of china nobody is saying go to war with china but we need to be able to have association with it that hurts us but dealing with ourselves where in the long term it's going to harm us uh commodore before uh, general uh, takes it over i would like to ask a quick question related to what uh, you spoke about the first one is uh, of course a point that i would like to make is of course we keep on talking about uh, the apis for the pharma industry coming from china the recent past what we have seen is they have simply hiked the price by 20% because they wanted to make the best out of the situation whereas on the other front if you look at it what people fail to tell the world is that india is considered as pharmacy of the world meaning including china we are the largest players of generic medicine right and even for we are exporting it to china so i mean uh, as you said i think uh, what people fail to see is that our own capability and then you know start believing it rather trying to say that you know we are so much relying on china so like a, a mutual relationship and coming back to uh, another question i have is uh, related to banking system recently i have been told that china is kind of imposing some restrictions on their citizens withdrawing money from their chinese banks uh, and so many other issues are going on so if you could shed a light uh, regarding that any one of you it would be of great help uh, since i have spoken enough i'll ask general narsimha to respond i'll come back again thank you thank you very much uh, before i before i uh, go and say what we should do i will come on a few points which has been covered by commodore wasan uh salami slicing is something that we need to actually look at it in detail we keep saying this but if you go along the border you will find that hardly any place where they have been able to make an ingress they try to make the ingress however we have been steadfast in ensuring that these areas are not getting affected or not getting intruded by the chinese when Whenever they tried this, that's all of Sundaram Chu. It took us seven years, but we ensured that they go back. So the issue that comes up is, till the time we don't have this agreed boundary, we will have these kinds of face-offs, and we should be prepared to ensure that no territory of ours goes to them. That is number one. Number two, as far as the COVID-related issues are concerned, now there have been lot of lot of reasons attributed to the present problem that we face on the line of actual control. one thing says that we are going too close to us and so they try to tell us that you shouldn't go too close by teaching us a lesson on the border second thing says that in the internal issues related to covid china didn't do well they wanted to divert the attention therefore they did this my understanding of the whole thing is that this is a purely bilateral and a territorial issue the other the other issues of aggressive behavior and all are not related to covid if you look at china's behavior in south china sea it has been aggressive over a long period of time but even in august last year you found they got into a scuffle with the vietnamese navy on the vanguard bank 
one day later around the winter time in december january they got into a tussle in malaysia they kept doing this all along i don't think that is related to covid but that is related to a overall aggressive strategy that they follow during covid you also found the wolf warrior diplomacy that they resorted to all the ambassadors went on a overdrive even even calling names of the leadership in the in their host countries so that is the kind of aggressive behavior that they had but over the last 2 3 months if you look at it that wolf warrior diplomacy has gone down there is no ambassador shouting from the rooftop say calling names on his host country so there is a correction process that has taken place as far as the wolf warrior diplomacy is concerned but as far as covid is concerned this is something that we need to we need to uh, we need to again think about twice before saying that it is a diversionary tactic the tactics was not diversionary because of that it is typically ensuring that the line of actual control they want to set foot and set that line so that is something that we need to be careful about as far as bri is concerned covid has resulted in a slight delay of the bri projects about 40% of the projects are supposed to be facing problems 20% of them are running as per the earlier schedule and the remainder are expected to have little slow progress in their pro- in their processes so as far as bri is concerned we monitor this in the center on a monthly basis we don't find a major upset happening but where the major upset is going to happen on the one belt one road initiative is when the all the countries are looking at either a debt rescheduling or debt to be converted into grants that is where the chinese are going to face a problem but to overcome that they have already rescheduled the loans of 77 countries so this is something that they have taken care of i won't rule out one belt one road it will be slow it will have problems but i think it will continue to progress is the way i see it as far as the a uh, decoupling from china is concerned now this is a trend that has come up please take your mind back to dolam when dolam issue was raging the entire country said boycott chinese projects this thing that thing everything six months down the line everybody went back to china please we, we should actually be aware of this particular problem with us at that point in time we should have started the indigenization process we should have started the manufacturing process to ensure that we don't continually depend on china but companies don't operate like that companies are looking at bottom line where the bottom line is better they tend to go there and that's what happened after dolam after covid again there is a shouting for uh, decoupling basically because most of your manufacturing including what the pharmaceutical sector was mentioned the automotive sector and the elect- electric um, your your um, led sector everything if you have to produce a bulk today by bajaj electricals the components have to come from china auto industry is depending on auto parts coming from china we need to restart all these things in india and that is where we go wrong and we need to continue the process of indianization so that we don't depend on china on this it will take time if you are going to say tomorrow i am going to stop everything it is not going to work we need to build our capacities and capabilities and thereafter decouple from them in the meanwhile we can also look at diversification of the sourcing that will help us in some way to overcome the problem last two points quad quad i think is now shaping up you need to look at the reports that have come up about couple of days ago that australia is going to be included in malabar and the the initial tentative talks that took place between joint secretary level at various places i been upgraded to the ministerial level i think slowly and steadily quad is coming into shape and lastly the question which came up on uh, china citizens drawing money etc there is a problem in china today when xi jinping came to power he had a foreign exchange reserves of 4 trillion dollars that came down to 3.1 trillion dollars over a period of time why did that happen two things one in 2015 the shanghai stock exchange collapsed and people started taking the money out and that money outflow was approximately 100 billion dollars a month it went on for 6 months they lost about 600 billion dollars in that plus one belt one road initiative the the the, the investment so far is approximately 340 billion dollars if you put these two together you get you almost arrive at the figure of 3.1 trillion dollars 
and for the last two years i have been monitoring this fdi uh, sorry the forex reserves of china it has stagnated and stabilized around 3.1 trillion dollars give or take a few billion this way that way so 3.1 trillion dollars is what they had the problem that they are finding is not the 3.1 trillion dollars the problem that they are finding is that their state owned enterprises are not delivering as they were expected to deliver that is one two covid has actually put down a problem regarding their exports initially there was a supply shock in the sense that china closed down and the supply shock occurred china then woke up in the month of march they started coming back to production and now they are almost 97% back on production the other countries have gone into the covid shock therefore they are now suffering from a demand shock so the supply shock and the demand shock they have to actually work on they don't know which way it will go this year their gdp is expected to grow on 1.2% that is the imf imf rating 1.2% is what it is supposed to grow again 6.1% of last year and so there is a downward trend in the economy in order to protect that and in order to ensure that the people don't take the money out this restriction has been imposed the second point is you must see what is happening in hong kong hong kong has been in turmoil for the last one year now and that actually what has happened us has put lot of sanctions on hong kong and they are not going to give the special status that they were giving it earlier they are going to treat it as it is part of china and if that happens hong kong will lose the special status and the round tripping that these people are resorting to from hong kong is going to suffer so therefore they need to take care of it and these are the reasons why this this particular issue has come up having said all this now how do we deal with china first thing that we need to do is it has to like for example in the last month month and a half you would have noticed there was a ruling on the fdi that the neighboring countries if any fdi comes in it will go through the government route and it will not go through any other route second thing is you went and banned 59 apps the problem with the apps is it is not money that we are looking at we were looking at the national security and the data security that is what actually made us stop the apps the fdi route the reason why we did that fdi one using covid they were using predatory buying in europe and india of startups and msmes to stop that we went and did that fdi business in between when this incident happened there was enough pressure put on by them particularly on the 15th june incident when they suffered more casualties they had a pressure on them so it is a whole of government approach that work the foreign ministers were talking the defense people were talking the uh, the uh, nsa were talking and prime minister's visit to ladakh also conveyed a strong message to them so it is a whole of government approach that was adopted to to ensure that this even this this incident that on the border are actually taken care of similarly this is the way to go even in future to handle china we need to tackle them at the international level diplomatically which has been done very well during this period we have to ta- tackle them economically the way we said we need to start indigenizing we need to build our capacities and capabilities we need to ensure that they not they do not get the leverage that we don't get the problem that we find with china is not the tariff barriers but the non tariff barriers and so we need and that is the reason you will find in the ports these days the chinese equipment the chinese container that come up go through a detailed scrutiny of course there is got another problem because they also do the same scrutiny that side and it delays your your own exports also but it is a whole of government approach that we need to do and we need to tackle them on all fronts defense economy political and international relations and that is the way to go a uh, general another quick question so last you are comparing last times doklam situation when people said boycott chinese thing versus this time as you rightly pointed out we are talking about this time government taking action against let's say the chinese applications or even the manufacturers associations or industry bodies taking the challenge of chinese saying that yes we are taking your challenge and we will decouple uh, on important areas right a very simple example is when when the covid got hit the entire car manufacturing segment uh, uh, stalled because they couldn't get the important components from chinese uh, manufacturers but uh, now they understand it of course even though the the entire car industry is in a deep uh, uh, trouble situation but um, uh, in in the in the past uh, you know whatever when when we compare it to the previous situation now i think situations are a bit different isn't it 
I think so. There is a see when you do something repeatedly and you get hit repeatedly, you learn your lessons. I think that is what is happening. So the problem is that we need to continue with that process. We should not give up six months down the line by saying that you know that makes give me gives me a good product and let me go and take it from there. So you find lot of these railway contracts, lot of the other contracts that have been actually cancelled in the recent past. There are two things for that. One is of course we didn't want to go through the Chinese route. Second thing also we need to deprioritize our investment investment proposals and investment plan that we had. Both put together has resulted in this. So we need to look at this process on a long term basis. Like for example, it is not now that we realize that we are dependent on API on China. Four years ago we we realized it. Three years ago we discussed in the NSAB and gave our recommendations on how to overcome this dependency. But the problem is. all and it is not that we are not manufacturing apis before we are a good manufacturer of api a world leader in api production in india and for the last 3 years those factories are still not able to come back online to their previous levels because of various sanctions uh, that has to be obtained various licenses that have been obtained various environmental requirements that have been obtained i think we need to move fast on that and ensure that these impediments are removed that is very important Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, General. I think uh, two important takeaways from what you have said. One is about you know this normal accusation about salami slicing. I know, and with a nation now which is totally has a free democracy, free press, everybody becomes an expert in satellite imagery, and you know they go around with saying <laughs> one thing or another, and uh, so therefore I am sure it's very. And, and they go to the extent of calling an Indian helipad a Chinese helipad. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is the unfortunately this is the perils of democracy where we given uh, you know this kind of freedom to the press but you know they go off tangent so therefore it's very reassuring to hear that chinese have not succeeded in this so called salami slicing uh, which they are saying despite what many of the other like us to believe the second thing is very valid in terms of how we need to shape our economic uh, growth uh, you know by delinking gradually that's an important point because uh, last 2 3 days you have been seeing a lot of uh, reports about how uh, you know even iphone is planning to set up a factory near shri parambadur through foxconn a 1 billion dollar and then uh, japan went to the extent of even uh, uh, supporting people who wanted to move out by pledging something like 2.2 billion dollar so therefore where there is a will there is a way so if india has to move out and if it has to support people i'm sure the policy formulation you know as you also correctly identified we failed in having the policies that help and promote local industry you know and also this uh, fascination for cheap products from china you know in fact before the uh, this incident every month you would have tens of thousands of traders going to china and you know tying up their package and having them transship to india so this is all about uh, the demand and supply and the profit the margin of profit that was there we need to move away from this and therefore i think like i said earlier the climate is ripe enough for us to look at alternatives whether it is huawei or 4g even 4g uh, since bsnl is government owned they clearly said 4g will be tweaked in such a manner that china will not have a way so 5g as i see in my assessment will not find anything over here despite all these nice videos that uh, uh ambassador of india ambassador of china and india is putting out on a daily basis he also wrote regularly uh, in hindu and other papers uh, <clears throat> saying that you know uh, it's a civilization is correct we should do so much etc etc so uh, what we noticed is that they say something but they don't mean it so even if you know the chinese language is difficult to interpret what they want to say or what they want to do so there are many questions here what i will do is general narsimhan i'll read out some of the questions that uh, ram has sent to me on whatsapp you can take them all together and respond because some of them are interrelated i'll just read them out this is come from the audience yeah so this is uh, right this border crisis has exposed a range of national security problem in uh, apparatus like deficient intelligence these are some assumptions again and deficient strategic assessment the narrative looks like chinese aggression came as a surprise to india uh, a question mark from my side on that uh, what happened to military satellite courage analytical interpretation of chinese intentions by analysis and observer in india 
This is from uh, one of my researcher, Balas Brumanyam. And now there are other questions. Pakistan as a factor in Chinese behavior towards India. This is from KM Gupta, basically to analyze uh, how we can deal with Pakistan and China uh, who have this strong alliance. Then from Captain Kankoje, uh, who is my old squadron mate, he has got three questions. Why are we not indulging in tit for tat salami slicing? I think that question has lost its relevance because of your clarification. And what is the military might to regain Aksai Chin and Shaskam Valley? So I can add here and to say, how does Article 370 uh, you know, come into play? And the third question I think is, where does giving recognition to Tibet, if we do, take us? And should we? And if so, when? So this is uh, uh, this is what we can uh, do. I think the initial organizers planned for 15 minutes. Uh, we have overshot. I, I think it does not matter to me if the organizers have no objections. There's also one question from uh, uh, General. Uh, one second, let me see this. Uh, so I would like to take up this question because uh, this is from a general who is familiar with this and who is a veteran here in Chennai. SR level talks agree to respect the LAC. Neither it is marked on the ground, nor on any mutually authenticated map. Perceptions differ. So how this class can be assured? China claims it has well-defined boundaries with 1214 neighbors, except India and Bhutan. If so, why can't this be achieved in a homebound class? This is from Major General Karthikeyan. I'm sure you know him. So this is where uh, the next question is on Indochina relationship. It's always been poor and there's mutual distrust. It, it's China, which invests into India easily and heavily, including through state-owned enterprises. What makes China take such decisions? An outbreak of war could even lead to expropriation of their investments. Their action in the border area do not seem to factor such risks, and they seem to have decoupled the two issues. Maybe they have enough confidence in India that we won't take actions against them. So these are some of the questions that are here. Commander, Commander, specific to the Pakistan question, I also request you to add Nepal. Sure, sure. Okay. So, Fine. Fine. Everyone will respond first on all these questions. But if there's anything that I would like to add to his question, I will do so. Are the organizers OK with extending the session? Uh, most welcome, Commodore. Most welcome, General. Right. Go ahead. Okay. OK, thank you. Uh, firstly, on the reshoring, which uh, uh, Commodore Watson mentioned about, Japan has earmarked $2.2 billion for reshoring companies which they want to come back to Japan from China. Please understand, last year, Taiwan invested $18 billion to help companies to come back to Taiwan. US is planning to invest $25 billion to assist companies to reshore or divert, go elsewhere from China. What, why I am saying this is, reshoring and decoupling like this also involves a lot of investment that we need to be prepared to do in case we want to attract some companies to ship from China and come to us to start manufacturing here in India. The second thing is, um, you know, Chinese are just saying, don't look at what we say, look at what we do. So that is what we should be careful about. We should not actually worry about what they are saying, but actually we should look at what they are doing. And that is where we will find our answers to many of the questions that come up here. The third thing is on the border national security surprise. Now, I don't think there was a surprise. In fact, when these vehicles moved in, it was already known that these vehicles have come. And vehicles are, the moment any vehicles move like this, they get continued monitoring. So it is not that we are not aware of what these guys are doing. And the only problem that happened was the short distance that they had to cover to come into this area. That is what surprised us. Other than that, you find that whenever the buildup of the Chinese took place, we had an equal and matching buildup happening in those areas. So to that extent, I don't think we were taken by surprise or we were taken in. But I think the, the speed with which they had to actually cover a very short distance is the one which actually led to all this. The third thing is on the part China, Nepal. I love Nepal as uh, one of the things which has been asked. Please understand, the present crisis in Nepal did not start because of Chinese inducement. Let us be clear about this. It started because of the internal problems that the prime, present Prime Minister of Nepal is facing. And our Raksha Mantri, the Defense Minister, 
declaring the lipo lake road open gave them a chance to give up the nationalism to stay on in power that is how the nepal issue started this time contrary to the general belief that chinese have induced it and nepal has fallen into china's hands because of this they are doing etc this i think we all need to take to the pinch of salt and in, and see how these things happen i am not ruling out china trying to fish in the muddled waters that can happen but the whole issue did not start because of china is what i wanted to cover as far as the china pakistan the, the collusion is concerned is it you even in during this this particular incident that was happening there were reports that you know the chinese new record y20 has landed in skardu 40 aircraft fighter aircraft of china has landed in skardu 20000 troops of pakistan have mobilized into gilgit baltistan all of them are lies pure lies nothing happened if you see if you see gilgit baltistan if they can absorb two divisions then there will be somewhere else i mean there were, these rumors came out and everybody started believing it that is not to say that china and pakistan will not cooperate with each other they will they will cooperate with each other in the sense the pakistan may supply them with information they may increase the terrorist activities in jnk those kind of things will definitely happen but i am not expecting a full blown two sided war coming on to us at this point in time but by the way the two front war is nothing new to india we have been discussing it for the last 15 years our own chief of army staff have made statements on this the first time the statement was made in 2000 Seven or eight by General Deepak Kapoor was the Chief Army Staff that time. We have war game written many of our war games. How to deal with this? I would request the audience to rest assured that these things are well catered for, and if push comes to shove, we will handle that. There is no problem on that. As far as the Tikrit multi multi might is concerned, there is a problem here. But if you look at the history, which I explained to you at the beginning of the session. you find that the chinese trains are coming into the indian territory in the, in the history of this we have never staked the claim on chinese territory so therefore if you have to do a tip the trade now you are actually going into chinese territory you are going to invite invite a massive retaliation which for which we should be prepared for if we want to do that not that we can't do it but the issue is we need to weigh this very very carefully before we go into such options the next thing is on the tibet uh, recognition of tibet now this is not the first time that this question is coming up we recognized tibet autonomous region as part of india somewhere in the mid 60s not now and from that time onwards we also actually supported this one china policy till about 2010 from 2010 onwards we have stopped making the statement on one china policy in any of the joint statement that they make prior to that yes we did so slowly and steadily we have conveyed to the chinese that if you don't support a one india policy you will not get support on the one china policy so that point is well understood by the chinese so slowly and steadily instead of saying we recognize tibet as a separate country like the like the bill that has been moved in the us senate to pass that you know we they recognize the tibet as a different country we don't have to go back on what we said but we can do things in other other matters to ensure that this matters can wait to the can wait to the chinese the sr level talks etc please understand the the statement like you know china has resolved the boundary with 12 countries only india and bhutan are left they don't want to resolve the boundary please understand gentlemen only one thing gentlemen and ladies only one thing that if at all we we negotiate anything and come to a conclusion please understand the area that you lose the territory that you lose will be indians so we need we should not be in a hurry to do this we need to think through this carefully and we need to take our time there is no need to hurriedly do this in in any form the <clears throat> the other thing is on the revision of investments etc now investments we also have, we also have actually dealing them please understand the year 1998 when we decided to dealing two things one china pakistan relations be china india relations being subservient to pakistan china pakistan relations we delinked second thing we delinked was let us keep the boundary issue aside let us make the progress on the bilateral relations in other fields like economy that is how you got into the state dispute 
I mean trade deficit. Trade we can do, culture we can do, people to people contact we can do, student exchange program we can do. We have been doing all that. So we are also actually dealing both. The only thing is the activity that we do otherwise is not visible in the public domain. Therefore, people tend to confuse that you know everything is subservient to the boundary issue. Uh, mutual distress, yes. To remove the mutual distress, we have got into a lot of things. I explained to you about the 1996 Conference Building Measure Agreement. We also did a 2013 Border Defense Cooperation Agreement. In between these, we also organized a number of activities to ensure the mutual trust between the forces that are facing each other. How did we do that? Take your mind back to 2007 <clears throat> hand in hand exercise. Hand in hand exercises started in 2007. They have been going intermittently depending on the relationship, but they have been continuing. Border games have been organized. Border exercises in Ladakh have happened between the border forces facing each other. We did a number of activities to improve the mutual trust. But when such events happen now, as it happened in May and June, all these things then go back. You'll have to restart this process again. So if this is a difficult process. It is going to take time. It is not that we are not being able to do it, but we will have to continue to make efforts to do this. That is what I would like to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, General. You know, just a few responses from my side on uh, you know what you have said. More to compliment than uh, anything else. You know, on the investments from China, there's a uh, you know common belief that you know there's so much that's been invested <clears throat> by China. When you look at the number of uh, countries who have invested in India. China ranks 18th, it's not number one, it's not number two, it's 18th country that has invested in India. So there are others ahead of us, including Singapore. A small country like Singapore has more investments in India than China. You must remember this. Also, when you quantify this, it's only 3.1% of GDP that has come out. Oh no, it's got a large share of GDP. <laughs> but, you know, this thing to say, no, 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 what will we do if we're dealing from China? Will not get any investments is not a fact anymore. Also, on the other issue of uh, you know the access being easier for Chinese to come in, is in fact a, a fact for worry because, because of the connectivity issues that we have, because of the slow development of our uh, uh, you know infrastructure in the border, they seem to have an advantage. <clears throat> but like General Naseman assures us, uh, we are ready for this and we are prepared for some things. Uh, you know, maybe you'd like to respond later and tell us why we did not press ahead with the mountain core that we wanted to develop over here. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we've been talking vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan in terms of a cold start. You know, so the platoon, the terrain that you're talking about, would it give this kind of an option to China if it if push comes to shove because of the fact that they're able to come in? Uh, unfortunately, today we do not have an Air Force representative with us. But there are some factors that I would like to bring out on this, on the deployment. As you all have seen, you know, the MiGs, the Sukhois, the Apaches and all that were deployed. Thankfully, we have the DBO, you know, the advanced landing ground, where we already carried out many landings of including the Globemaster, you know, the heavy lift aircraft, which can bring in tanks and all that. So the air bridge is active and intact. Likewise, we also carried out many exercises in Car Nicobar, World Player, etc., for operation of our fighter aircraft. I would feel that they should be, we should have already deployed them in large number from Andaman Nicobar, which is the only tri services command as a theater command that we have. And also, Air Force, as far as India is concerned, you know, as was as has been brought out by many Air Force officers who served there, <clears throat> we enjoy terrain advantage here, unlike the uh, other aspects. Because our aircraft from here can take off with a larger payload because most of them are at 2,000, 3,000, or 5,000, where the payload carrying capacity is much higher. Whereas all the airfields in the Tibet plateau are located at 12 to 14,000 feet, which means that he has to take off with either less fuel or with less ammunition. And also at that rarefied atmosphere, there are serious issues of operation. So the tanker will have to always be there which itself is a vulnerable target the moment you bring in the AVAX and all that. So that is the nature of air warfare uh, which will unfold when it comes to this. So, uh, uh, you know, since uh, a lot of uh, Air Force and Army issues have been covered, only thing on Navy I would like to bring out being a Navy man is that, please remember, in 1971, Navy came of age. 
was able to have a effective blockade. I'm not saying that you can do it today because the maritime environment in the North Arabian Sea has become complex. You could have a Chinese submarine and a Pakistan submarine together operating there, making it difficult for India to exercise its sea denial and sea control operations. But please remember, even in Kargil, I was the Chief Staff Officer Operations in Southern Naval Command, and we had the complete Eastern Fleet rounding Sri Lanka and being deployed in the Western Front to put pressure on Pakistan because the internal analysis from many Pakistani strategic analysts tells you that they were worried about another blockade that could be implemented if Kargil slipped into the maritime domain. So today, uh, I feel, it's my personal opinion, that we should have activated our fighter bases <laughs> on and in Port Blair and have your maritime aircraft operating. Luckily, we have an excellent aircraft in the PADI, which is also being used by the Army. Uh, coincidentally, I was the first commanding officer of INS Rajali. And, you know, we have contracted for 20 PADIs that are going to be here. This is the Poseidon aircraft. In fact, India was only the second uh, naval aviation service to operate this. So we have a phenomenal capability. Chinese have been coming in a big way into the Indian Ocean region. And they have, I'm very fond of using this term, tyranny of distance. If he has to come all the way from, uh, uh, you know, Shanghai or any other place, he has to come up cover tens of thousands of kilometers, and then coming to through the states of Malacca or many other options which are available. I'm not going to the details. That's not a presentation on the Navy that we'll be doing tomorrow when we have another webinar. So those of you who are free can join that tomorrow. But the point here is that China has a geographical disadvantage. And we are blessed with geography. And we need to be able to leverage this for applying enough pressure. So none of the submarines included cannot transit out of the states of Malacca and Singapore, which is called SOMS, because you have the Tri Services Command and we have the watchful eyes of the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard. And so we need to strengthen the uh, C4ISR architecture manifold. But in such times of crisis, to put pressure on them, I feel that Tri Services Command should be in the forefront of applying. Now, the Quad has become a reality, and you know whether people like it or not, whether China is not happy about this alliance. You know, we need to ensure that Quad not only discharges its responsibility in the maritime domain, but also becomes an effective instrument of what we routinely refer to as HADR, as humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So, these are some of the points I wanted to bring out in terms of uh, both the uh, capability of the Air Force, the Navy, which is an instrument of foreign policy, which all need to be used in tandem to apply the required kind of pressure. China is aware. China is very worried about, uh, you know, what, how India will use Andaman Nicobar to strike its uh, advance into the Indian Ocean region, because which is why it also acquired Djibouti, a military base in Africa. It wants bases in Gwadar. It wants it's already got Hamban Tota, a captive port for 99 years. The reason why it's coming through the economic road into Bangladesh, Myanmar, is to ensure that it has a footprint in the Bay of Bengal and in the Arabian Sea to further its strategic, economic, and political interests. General Narmay would you like to come in on this? No, this is perfectly fine. What you said, I totally endorse that. You see, the issue that comes up is we keep talking about some Chinese submarine coming and docking somewhere, they are passing through somewhere. Please understand the moment they cross the Malacca Strait, they are under our observation. Absolutely. That is something that, that, that we need to understand. And in fact, we send a friendly message to them. Welcome to the Indian Ocean from the Indian Navy. So that they are aware. So that they are aware that they are being followed and monitored. And the and 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 the and the and the and the thing about Indian Navy is its capabilities are enormous. Even the Chinese actually used to be envious of the Indian Navy. In fact, in 2004, when I was traveling in a taxi in Beijing, that time the driver asked, I was talking to the driver in Chinese, and that guy says, you know, you have a wonderful Navy. I said, I asked him, why have you said this? He said that I'm a, I'm an old Navy man from the, from the PLA Navy, and we always envy you for having an aircraft carrier right from the 50s. So he says, you have enormous capabilities and we are envious of you. They also assessed our fighting that has happened in 65, 71, and 99. And they have understood that Indian armed forces are no pushovers. And they also know 
that Indian Navy is, for, is, is a formidable opposition for them as far as Indian Ocean region is concerned. So I think with this uh, with these remarks, I think I would like to hand it back to Commodore Wasson. Uh, thank you, General. I think all this is very reassuring. We also seem to know what we need to do, but we must have the will to do it. Uh, so I think there are no more questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Ramesh, if you could kindly take over and uh, conduct the balance proceedings. Yeah. Th thank you, Commodore Wasson, and uh, thank you, General Narsimhan. It's uh, our pleasure and honor to have you here. And I think you have answered many unanswered questions. I think it would uh, uh, remove a uh, lot of doubts that different people would have or those who have got misguided by the so-called mainstream media. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure this is uh, the, this, this this session. I'm sure a lot of people will be watching uh, beyond what uh, who, the participants here. And uh, uh, thank you so much. Of course, we will have a, a follow-up program as well. As Commodore suggested, I think we need to go with an arrangement uh, next time and uh, have our discussion further. Thank you so much. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commodore Rahul, sir. Thank you, General Nassiman and all the audience and the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. We look forward to many more such events. But let's continue to support what we make in India. Jai Hind. Definitely. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.